Dan, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I so appreciate it. Rick, um, why don't you, uh, can you, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on what Stan has just shared with us? Please. Yeah, well, uh, well, Stan, yeah, I appreciate that too. And uh, the connection 1973, and I am aware of a lot of the activity you've had in Pennsylvania, especially in the geography you mentioned. It's just uh, overwhelming. Um, And I talked um, at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference last year with some witnesses that were from that area and mentioned that same geography and the connection with UFOs came up. Um, I deal with uh, at some different shows and uh, know some people that are MUFON people in uh, Tennessee, and they've approached us as Bigfoot investigators and said they go on out to investigate sightings and get to places, talk to people, and more often than not, Bigfoot comes up. People have Bigfoot sightings subsequent to UFO uh, sightings or uh, encounters. So there's, there is a connection. You know, we know there's a connection there. Um, it just keeps coming up, but we don't know what it is entirely. So I, I appreciate you saying it. You know, you're not trying to say it's a passenger on a craft, that sort of thing, but it, there does seem to be a connection. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And what I'm getting from many researchers in the Bigfoot field, especially in the last few years, it's not only in Pennsylvania, it's around the country. Many Bigfoot researchers who are out in areas where there's a lot of active Bigfoot activity being reported for years, they're seeing strange light phenomena. They're seeing orbs of light. Even I don't like to call it that, but they're seeing balls of light, and sometimes other strange light luminous phenomena in the area, and that's something they cannot explain. And that's going on more and more. We had a case um, May of last year, 2019, outside of Pittsburgh. A man happened to look out his window. I think it was around 3 o'clock in the morning. It's all woods behind his home. He sees this small Bigfoot, about four and a half to five feet tall, walking across the yard into a particular section of woods. The moment it went into that section of woods and was gone, moments later, a sphere of bright light came out of there, appeared luminous, disappeared, reappeared, projected a beam of light along the ground, and disappeared and was gone. And, I mean, that's just a minor sampling of, of kind of, of these type of cases that are going on. And, um, but I've seen more and more interest in people in recent years in the Bigfoot field who were very, very skeptical of this many years ago. But I think they're asking mm-hmm. the same question I've asked for years. And, of course, the skeptics say the same thing. Where are the bodies? And I had some right. of those amazing cases that gave us some clues as to why there are no bodies uh, back in the 70s and since then. Oh, yeah, we were before you got on. We were talking about that a little bit, and it came up last week too. And uh, you know, I went forth and just said, you know, large animals, large creatures in the woods. Rarely do you find the you know the skeletal remains, bodies anyway, too. But uh, and then uh, Sanjay was saying that they could bury their own, and I you know said that you know there's never a Bigfoot. They're always in groups and with each other, and they look out for each other. I even put forward that they have a common, you know, mindset that they can tap into so they can, you know, know about things from the collective overall, too. But, uh, um, yeah, no, I'd like to hear that, what your thoughts are on, on the bodies. All right, well, go back historically, back to this 1970s, or all this phenomenon has gone 1973 into 74. And, I mean, I'm just going to give you a, a brief summary. We can go into great detail just per case. But, of course, the most famous UFO Bigfoot incident occurred on October 25, 1973, up in Fayette County outside of Uniontown, Pennsylvania. The short part of the story is I got a call from a state trooper from the barracks up there. He just came back from investigating this multiple witness UFO incident, a UFO landing in a field, and there were two Bigfoot standing there in the field at the same time. And... I talked to the trooper. He said he thought there may be something still up in the field. He wanted me to send the team up as soon as we could. So we got our our gear together. It was late at night. We got our gear together. We found our way up to Fayette County. And um, to make the story short, there were about 15 people in that rural community that sees this very large red ball shaped object, big spear as big as a barn, about 100 feet off the ground, slowly moving downward. Um, the story focuses on the, the son of the farmer who owned the, the farm out there. He was coming out to visit his family, he's driving down the farm road and sees people standing outside and on the porch looking at this thing in the sky. It looks like it's coming downward. So he goes to a, 
a neighbor's house higher on the hill to get a better perspective, and it looks like it's going to land on his dad's farm. So he and two of those neighbor boys decide they want to go up and see what this thing is. He stops over to his dad's farm, grabs a thirty out six and a handful of ammunition. He didn't realize it at the time, but he had two tracers in that ammunition. And, of course, those that hunt, you all know you just get that luminous trail. Anyhow, as they're riding down the farm road, the dogs in the air are going crazy. They hear this high-pitched whining noise and these loud baby crying sounds. They get to the, they walk up to the top of the pasture, and they're standing there because they can't believe what they're seeing. About 250 feet away, this object is now on the ground or right above it. But now it's about it's about 100 feet in diameter. It's a big white dome like a half a spear. And they're just standing there in amazement. They, they can't believe what they're seeing. But as they're looking around at this thing, there was a barbed wire fence about 75 feet away. That's what attracted their attention. Along the barbed wire fence, walking in their direction, are these two huge, tall, bipedal creatures, one behind the other. The one in front's about eight feet tall. The one behind is about seven feet tall. They're taller than the fence posts of the barbed wire fence. Their first thought, they've got to be bare. But this, the, the main witness, he's been hunting for years, said these things were bipedal, walking upright, covering long, dark, matted hair hanging down off the body, no neck. The arms were so long they almost were touching the ground. They have luminous green eyes, eyes about the size of a 50-cent piece, and they are making this loud, baby, crying, whining noise. One boy so scared ran, ran out of the field. The other kid starts yelling at him, shoot him, shoot him. So he fires his first round. First round, it's a tracer. He just had that luminous trail. He fires the second tracer, and when he does, the largest of the two creatures reaches out as though to grab that tracer, makes a loud, whiny, crying noise, and at the same time, the object suddenly vanishes and disappears. It doesn't take off. It's just gone. Most of the luminosity is gone. The sound stops. The creatures turn around, start walking back towards the woods along the barbed wire fence. At that point, he's, he's firing live ammo from his 30 out 6 to the, at the creatures, mainly aiming at the, at the largest one, which was staring at him with the glowing green eyes as he's firing right into it with no effect on it whatsoever. Uh, they ran out of the field, ran back to the truck, went to the farmhouse, took the family out of there, went to the neighbors and called the state police. And again, the short part of the story is the trooper and the witness went up in the troop car. They're looking around for evidence, and the state trooper told me the area where the object was out on the ground was self-luminescent and glowing, about 100 foot or more in diameter. He said the farm animals wouldn't go anywhere near the area. He said he had a flashlight. He said he shined the beam. He could barely see the beam. And he said it was bright enough that if he had a newspaper, he could have read a newspaper from the light coming off the glow. When they went back to the barracks, wow. I was told the witness and the trooper were taken to two separate rooms, separately interviewed, and then they called my team to come up. And things got much weirder during the night. I wrote the whole thing up in my Silent Invasion book, probably one of the strangest cases ever recorded in the world. People from all over the world look at that story and it makes you wonder what was going on. That was the case that convinced me and some of the skeptical research people on my team that there was a lot more to Bigfoot than meets, um, mm -hmm. that comes down to what we just didn't know about Bigfoot. It's much stranger than an unknown primate. But it was cases as continued on that got even much stranger. And there was um, an incident only miles from there, up near uh, Ohio Pile, way up in the mountains, close to the ridge, uh, in November... So that would have been November the next month, where fellows walking here as hunting dogs at night. He had a lot of property up there. There should have been nobody on his property. It was dark, and ahead of him, he sees this tall figure. And he yells out, you know, what are you doing on my property? There's no response, and realizes this is not a human, but it's a tall, hair-covered creature running ahead of him. He grabs his sidearm, starts shooting at it. He said, I know I hit it. And he said, I shot at it. I hit it. It physically disappeared in front of me, but we could still, I could still hear it running. And then oh. in that same general area in February, February 6, 1974, was the case of all cases that convinced me that we're dealing with something much stranger than an unknown primate. And if you want, I'll be glad mm -hmm. to go into that story for you as well. 
Uh, I, we would love to hear more, Stan. But uh, you know, I'd like one thing I'd like to talk about because I think this is something all three of us have experienced. And I know Stan, with the hundreds, if not thousands, of people that contact you, uh, we would like. To, what are some of the most common, uh, Rick? What was that word? Misconceptions that that people well, have. Well, one of the misconceptions is, is, and I think. Oh, go ahead. Uh, one of the uh, things we'll, is we'll have Rick. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Oh yes, go ahead. Well, no, we were we were saying, you know, what are some of the common beliefs about uh, Bigfoot, and you know, common misconceptions about it. And to answer your question, Sanjay, about you know misconceptions, I think one of the things that pops up all the time is people think there's one Bigfoot, or Bigfoot is a creature, a large creature that lives in Northern California or the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so that comes up a lot. Everybody, another one is everybody thinks it's just covered with shaggy hair and it's some looks like something from the commercials on television, you know, like for uh, uh, beef jerky or something. Because uh, it's Bigfoot has become part of the culture now, and the way it's portrayed, you know, is like Harry and the Hendersons. It's a big, goofy, jolly creature, and, and I'm not, you know, I don't think that's a very, I don't think that's a good thing necessarily. First, I think it's good that we're all. You know, as a society, we talk more and more about this thing. Like, you know, it's right now it's kind of like a cartoon character, and no, it's not real. People think, but um, there's certainly a lot more than one. And you know, I'm, I've heard population estimates from thousands to, you know, over a million. So, uh, from accredited type people, I don't know what the number is, but there's lots of them. Uh, to Stan's point, there's a, you know, there's connections between this and other cryptids. Uh, there's connections between the, this and UFOs. I don't think people have any idea about those connections. But those of us that research this and get into it more and more, you know, learn about those things. And I wonder how long it's going to take before those types of things come forward and become part of the common conversation. Yeah, it, it's fa- very fascinating. And, and one of the things that shows up is the fact that a lot of people talk about that terrible, horrific odor or smell associated with Bigfoot sightings. However, there are many, many incidents where there's no smell whatsoever. And right. um, I did get to smell it. I, I can tell you a fascinating story. During the 73 outbreak, um, a police chief uh, called me to come down to interview t- two local women. This is in um, Westmoreland County along the Chestnut Ridge where there were a lot of sightings going on then and still are continuing to be reported year after year. But um, it was a very warm night, and this woman, the mother, is uh, in her bedroom sleeping. She had the window open, there were drapes closed, and began to toss and turn and felt like something was somebody was watching her. She turns over, and here only a few feet away is the window, and this creature, now this window is nine feet off the ground, this creature was bent down, had opened up the drapes, and was looking directly at her right into her face. I mean, she drew the sketch of this thing, the wrinkled skin, the eyes, and she was, I mean, she was just very, very shook up, as you can imagine. It backed away from the window, walked around the house. A few minutes later, her daughter started screaming the other side of the house about seeing the biggest shadow she had ever seen. And just about at that time, this horrific smell begins to just hang over the whole area and, and come into the house. It smelled like something had been dead for a long time. Very sickening odor. They went to the local police because they heard rumors that the police had shot and killed this creature that had been in the news, and they wanted to look mm-hmm. at it to see if what they had seen. Of course, that was not true. It was a rumor. But anyhow, the police chief called me down there. I was down to three days later after when he called me, and I could still smell that rotten smell inside the house. Good. Wow. And it was still lingering <laughs> inside the house. Yes. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. Ugh. Oh gosh. And look at well, and speaking of bedroom windows, um <laughs> uh I've had some interesting experiences here at the cottage and Stan, I don't know if you saw one of my latest reports that I just sent out uh with the handprint that I found on the window. Uh, one morning, I uh, had, had gotten up and was uh, taking a shower and went to open the window to just let the steam out. And when I pulled back the blinds, discovered an enormous handprint on the window and uh, investigated it immediately and realized that the tip of the fingers from the ground was all, was well over eight feet. 
uh, from the ground, uh, you know, outside uh-huh. the window. And uh, clearly, you know, something had put its hand there, and uh, it was it was enormous in it. And I had the in, there was the left hand or the uh, you know the right hand was almost a full print, and the left hand was like it was cupped or sideways. And I, and I almost got the impression it was looking into my bedroom, <laughs> uh, which was not the most comforting uh, feeling uh, one, one can imagine. Oh yeah, it's there are so many stories out there. I'm, I had one case up in Armstrong County a few years ago where a woman was uh, fell asleep on her porch in a wooded area where there had been a lot of history of Bigfoot sightings. Apparently, while she was sleeping, this long hairy arm <laughs> touched her and awakened her, and then ran off. And um, oh, good heavens! But it's, it's just there are so many stories. And by the way, my theory on the odor, the smell, is that. It may have something to do with the process of these coming in and out of our physical reality. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah, that, that's, oh, let's, uh, let's Stan, more that's a good. That. That's a yeah. That's a good. That's a good theory. I've actually uh, heard something similar to that. Um, it would fall in line with them being able to control the. You know, we were talking in I think the prior show about could they deploy the smell if they wanted to get you away from them and keep you out of an area. Um, you know, and I've I've noticed it we were saying Sanjay was saying too, it comes on fast all of a sudden. Even your story about the one looking in the window at the woman, all right, no smell then goes around the other side of the house and uh, the smell then happens, the daughter smells it. So I do think there's a control mechanism with the smell. So whether they're there one minute disappearing and coming back or to your point, you know, if they're stepping in and out of our realm or our reality, God knows we, we have a hard time understanding that. Um, there is a, something is going on with them um, that causes that smell to happen. I don't believe it's involuntary. It's just a smell that emits from them because they roll around in their own feces out in the woods and they can't help it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, and yeah. And, and, case, we'd, yeah, we'd smell it all the time. It wouldn't just happen. Just right. you know, it wouldn't come and go. And and I, I seem to recall. And Stan, I I think did you ever know John Keel? And now, of course, I followed his um, all of his writings in the time, but I never had the opportunity to meet John Keel. Okay, okay. I, and the reason I bring up John Keel is, of course, in his book regarding the uh, Mothman of uh, Point Pleasant, is that he references um, not only you know just an astonishing range of different types of sightings and encounters, but also that horrible sort of sulfurous smell, the rotten egg sewage smell. And it makes me wonder: did he, did he know what that meant, and did he realize that there was something, uh, for lack of a better word, otherworldly going on that that no one else had tumbled to yet? Yeah, again, and in so many of these cases, when you look into these localized outbreaks of these various phenomena, I mean, you you have these historically. I mean, you have a local mm-hmm. event here in Pennsylvania. You have the Momo. And during 73, by the way, and you brought up a few of those locations, there were other areas of the country that were having very intense Bigfoot and UFO activity. There was activity in Tennessee, and one place was Giles County, Tennessee. A lot of people don't mm-hmm. even know about it. A massive wave going on in 73 with all kind of phenomena and anomalies going on at the time. There was a lot of sightings in, in, in the state of Indiana. Ohio, um, different Maryland, different places, but not to the extent it was going on in Pennsylvania. And um, these things are continuing to happen. These incidents go on every year, all the time. But in the last two years, or I should say 2018 and 2019, I've, here in Pennsylvania, I've seen the largest surge of activity since 73. Not the huge numbers of reports, but the continuous quality of the reports coming in with both UFOs, Bigfoot, and cryptids. And some of these cases are just amazing. I'll be glad to go over some of those if you like. Oh, yes, please. Well, I want to um, stand and oh, go ahead, Rick, please. Well, I'd like to just uh, touch on um, what you're saying there, Sam, because I, I find it fascinating um, that you say the last two years there's been a lot of activity uh, coming on, because there's some, you know, I belong to some different groups, and I get on a lot of expeditions with a lot of different BFRO investigators, um, and there's discussions between a, a number of us online about activity and we're at a lot of places, 
it seems to um, be waning in the last couple of years. So less Bigfoot activity. Uh, and that yet there are hot spots. I've done a number of, uh, been on a number of expeditions in North Georgia in the last couple of years. And uh, uh, actually the uh, expedition Bigfoot, the museum that's on Dave Bakara, he, who runs that, he takes a lot of reports and there's a lot of activity in that area. It's a hot spot. Yeah. Um, but other areas, not so much. And to the point, even some of the investigators said, we're not getting reports, witnesses aren't reporting, and uh, there's not, to, not as much to follow up as. So I, I don't know what's going on with this cy- cyclically, but it seems like there are hot spots with this, and it kind of ebbs and flows in different geographies. What do you think of that? Yeah, and, and I've been in touch with some other researchers around the country, and they've told me in the last year or so they're also seeing an increase in activity as well. So I guess it just depends where you're at. And, and again, it, a lot of it has to do with how people know where to report sightings to, because I'm I'm convinced these things are going on everywhere, but a lot of people don't know who to call to report sightings to or who's really investigating the reports. Oh, I, I think you're yeah. absolutely right. If people don't know where to call, and and it's not something you can look up in the phone book, uh, I would say even nowadays. You know, if you know someone say in the north suburbs of Chicago had an encounter with something, you know, where would would they know where to look? And I, I'm not sure that the answer is out there. It's certainly much more visible than it was even five years ago. And and say what you will, but I do think we have, you know, the, the program Finding Bigfoot to thank for that. Yes. And to raising, you know, not only awareness, but visibility of this that creature and of, that there's other stuff out there. Uh, but that being said, and, and maybe we can segue into this very quickly, uh, uh, gentlemen, what do you do when you receive a report, uh, Stan and Rick, that is clearly hoaxed? Well, I, I can tell you this. Uh, not that common we get overt hoaxes. And most of the time, when you would get those reports, is when there would be something going on and it was getting news. So during mm-hmm. 73, when all this activity is going on for months and months, and there was a lot of news coverage in a lot of areas at, at certain locations, certain areas, and you would get calls on footprints. And we'd get out there, and as soon as we saw them, it was so apparent that they were fabricated. I mean, you could see somebody cut um, a shape out of wood and was stamping the wood across the ground. And we, we had ways to tell what was real. And I'll tell you, after you've been out there interviewing thousands of people over the years, and you interview these people, and you hear the emotion, you get the, the little details a lot of people don't want to talk about, and you can generally tell in most cases who's fabricating a story and who is not. But there have been not a lot of overt hoaxes, but there have been misidentifications, just like with UFO sightings. Many, many UFO sightings are misidentifications of planets and stars and reentry of space debris and Chinese lanterns and drones and so on and so forth. And with Bigfoot, mm-hmm. we've had large shaggy dogs reported, bear, hunters in camouflage outfits. So there's certain things that we can eliminate. But so many okay. reports I've investigated are very detailed, close reports. I can go over one happened two years ago outside of Pittsburgh, and I mean, I was there the next morning. And, the, I mean, that witness i mean he was be honest with you he was shaking emotionally upset very very shook up but gave us an amazing head-to-toe description of this thing that was basically five feet standing in the road looking right through his face with glowing red eyes holy cow i I think i'd be shaking at that well i got to report um, like 15 minutes after it happened that night and i talked to a relative of his that evening and then i talked to him and the next day we were down on the scene. Unfortunately, it poured rain all night. It was covered with leaves, no evidence out there. But it's a fascinating story. But it also has an interesting little detail at the end, which adds more to the mystery as well. Oh, please. I'd love to hear it. All right. Well, so, well, this one occurred um, down in the Mon Valley region outside of Pittsburgh. So, these are these small little communities that border along the Monongahela River. And historically, many, many Bigfoot sightings down there. I was down there. My teams were down there in the 70s and 80s and more recent years. We keep getting reports from different people. 
And some of these, again, are very, very, very detailed accounts. But this particular one was in early November of 2018. It was a very dark, rainy night. Fellow's riding down this two-lane farm road uh, down the Mon Valley. He has his low beams on at the time. And as he's riding along the road, about 50 feet in front of him, he sees what appears to be something standing on the left side of the road. Put his high beams on, begin to move forward very slowly, and suddenly this huge seven-foot-tall hair-covered creature walks out onto the roadway, literally stops five feet in front of his car. It was so close at first, he couldn't see the bottom of his legs and arms because it was so close. The car was um, covering it up. And the thing turned. Um, the witness was stunned. The creature stopped on the road, turned to look directly at him. Then it turned and ran off with very long strides as it leaped across the road from left to right. He could see its long, long arms swinging as it ran. The hands of the creature were in a closed or in a cuffed position. And I've been getting more calls like that in the last couple of years. It ran up a oh, slight hill. Really? The motorist grabbed his cell phone to load it up to try to get a picture and followed the creature for, in the vehicle for a short distance. But he said in a matter of seconds, it was gone. He said, this baffled him. He said, I don't understand. And he said, it's dark, but I have my high beams on, my headlights. It was right in front of me, and it, it's gone. And he couldn't understand that. And, you know, I, I went up and I looked at the area where he was, and I've been out in the woods many times at night. My eyes are already adjusted to the darkness. I've looked at cattle and horses and cats and other animals in the dark. And we, and we thought, well, maybe you just went out of the range of the headlights, but you still should have been able to see that very tall, very massive shape. And he couldn't explain why, why it was suddenly just gone, which is what we're hearing from more and more people. But to go on, he said this thing's seven foot tall, covered with shaggy brown and black hair on much of the body. But he said it looked unhealthy as though it was sick. There were areas on the oh. body where the hair was missing or sparse, though it had mange. The head was the size of a watermelon, somewhat peanut-shaped. face was long and narrow. The nose appeared large, about four inches long. The cheeks were sunk in and looked unhealthy. He said he could not see the mouth due to the hair cover. The chest had sparse amount of hair compared to the creature's back that was covered. The arms were very long and hung down to at least the kneecaps. The hands were about twice the size of an adult human. They were brown in color and hairy. The lower section uh, he could not see when it stood close to the car because it was blocked by the view. But anyhow, we can go into more and more detail. But he said the eyes, here you go about the luminous eyes. Um, and he said it was very muscular. The shoulders were massive. The waist was thinner. The eyes were the most frightening thing, he said. The eyes were larger than the humans and were luminous. He said they were beet red, luminous, decided to shiny like flashlights. He said the creature looked directly at him, eye to eye, turned and ran off. And, I mean, it was a very, very detailed account. Um, you know, let's, the one thing I think uh, that we'd like to uh, hear about, Stan, and this, I mean, I can't imagine being that close to one and not pass, you know, running out of the woods absolutely screaming for my life. Uh, but uh, speaking of which, I have been that close. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Rick, Rick and I were, one of the things we were talking about with encounters, uh, Stan, that I think is, absolutely fascinating is um, when you get reports in and uh, Rick you can elaborate on this please the uh, what what has been termed I guess uh, this whole sort of mind speak where where people hear something speaking to them not necessarily audibly but almost inside their own head yeah um, yeah no, I, I think we should talk about I just want to uh, just touch base on your prior question quickly too because you made a good point about the show uh and it seems you know finding bigfoot did a, a good job of grabbing our curiosity collectively about this um general public wise um i mean those four people got that out there um they had a pretty good formula for the show I, I actually that show was much better than this recent one i saw on uh, uh i don't know what they're calling it expedition bigfoot or something but it, it was on sunday nights recently on um uh, travel channel, I guess, but that wasn't very good at all. But uh, okay. at least they did they had a method, and they went out and they talked to witnesses. That you know they capitalized on the reports that were out there, and you could see in the show people at those town halls that would stand up that were had a genuine encounter. You know, as Stan, as you described, 
you know, they talked about what they went through. You could see the emotion. And, you know, I think as an investigator, and I've investigated in Wisconsin, Tennessee, now in uh, North Carolina, but when you find an actual witness, somebody who has been through something like that, it makes an emotional impact on them. You know, you, in every one of these, when you investigate, you should always press for detail. 